Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for session two of RevUp 2020. I'm Ryan Schoenecker. I'm the SVP of Sales and Marketing at Revel. And today's panel session is about how personalization in healthcare truly impacts the individual. A few things before we get started. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, there are two options at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll be taking a look at that and then uh, going through questions towards the end. Also, make sure to stick around after the panel. We're going to be having a session, an innovation session from Louise Bergulio, who is our SVP of Technology and Development. She's going to be talking about how to conduct behavioral research and what you can benefit from that. At the very end, as you leave the session, there's also a survey you'll be asked. Please complete that survey for the chance to have a $100 donation to the charity of your choice. Also, we'll be live tweeting this, so please feel free to chime into that conversation. It's hashtag RevUp2020. This week, we will be recording the session, and that will be posted on RevUpShow.com. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Robin Roberts, to introduce us to our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, for our panel today, I want to introduce our three esteemed guests. Uh, Mr. Tom Lindquist, CEO of Alina Health Aetna. In his role, Tom leads the joint venture of the organizations, setting the overall strategic direction for the organization in directing the executive team. Before joining Alina Health Aetna, he was president of Molina Healthcare of South Carolina. Our next panelist today, Ms. Stephanie Franklin with Humana. Stephanie is leading population health strategy in the Bold Goal Initiative, where she's co-creating solutions to address social determinants and health-related social needs for Humana's members and its communities. And our third panelist today, June Simmons. June is the president and CEO of Partners in Care Foundation, whose mission it is to shape the evolving health system by developing and spreading high value models of community-based care and self-management for diverse populations with chronic conditions. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I'm glad we get to be here to talk about personalized health. Um, before we get started, I wanna be clear about our context. We're talking today not about specific genomic work or precision medicine in the clinical sense, but rather we're talking with all of our panelists today about personalized health as a means of supporting a patient's unique diagnosis or wellness journey. This could, could include the way they interact with a physician, be it virtual or physical, uh, and supporting clinical, social, emotional, and maybe even economic needs. So to begin today with our three guests, I'd like to start by asking Stephanie Franklin, again of Humana. You know, Stephanie, I'm sure you guys do a lot of work with your members and personalized healthcare is really about the patient. Uh, could you share with any of our listeners today, maybe a story either, you know, in your professional scope of work there at Humana about maybe a member, beneficiary, or family that kind of yeah. exemplifies the context we're speaking about? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me on this panel. Yeah, I want to tell you all the story of Teresa. Teresa is one of our Medicare Advantage members, and uh, she doesn't live near family. She has multiple chronic conditions, including an autoimmune disease and anxiety for which she um, goes to therapy. So pre-COVID, she was able to use her health plan benefits to really manage um, all the aspects of her health, her physical, her social, and mental health needs. Um, for instance, she regularly attended a Silver Sneakers group exercise class where she got social interaction and it helped her really manage her stress. Obviously, in our current climate, um, it makes managing her health a bit more difficult. So uh, she, reached, she was reached out to by one of Humana's care managers who asked her some questions about uh, how she was managing her health and what challenges she was facing. And a few things came up. One, uh, she was afraid to go to the grocery store to buy food because of her compromised immune system. She could no longer attend her exercise classes and she was feeling really anxious, obviously, and isolated. And on top of it, she was worried if she could even get access to her medications that she needed. So together, they, they created a plan. First, they started, um, the care manager explained that she did have telehealth benefits, so she could continue getting um, that therapy that she really needed to help manage the stress, particularly during this really challenging time. Second, um, 
she helped connect her to Mel the Humana's Mail Order Pharmacy so she could get all her prescriptions so she wouldn't have to worry at all about that. Uh, third, food. Obviously, um, a big, you have, she needed access to, to food and safely. So uh, the care manager uh, helped by sending, uh, but by making, ha sorry, by having food delivered to Teresa at her home so she wouldn't have to worry about it right now. Uh, through Humana's basic needs program. And then they also made a long-term plan uh, to identify a neighbor who might be able to help bring her some groceries uh, on a regular basis. And finally, uh, they made a plan for a safe at-home workout routine so she could continue getting um, that part of her, her um, health management uh, included. They found, remembered some cheer exercises she learned from PT. So it was really through hearing what the, our member was saying, seeing her as an individual and having specific needs that they were able to work together to alleviate some of Teresa's anxiety and give her some peace of mind and let her know that she's not alone, not alone right now. I'm sure that's probably indicative of what a lot of members are facing right now. You know, Tom, as you hear uh, Stephanie talk about the food program, the care management effort, the time that it takes to go into that. Talk to us about really the business side of personalized healthcare. How do we begin to balance all these individualized needs with really what's going on in healthcare as a business and an industry? Because it certainly is that. It is, so thanks Robin for uh, having me on the panel. It, you know, when, when I think about the business of healthcare, it has changed dramatically over the last six six months. We've we've moved more in six months than I think we have in ten years in some ways, um, and that's and that there's a little bit of a silver lining there. We've we've been forced to do things differently. We've been forced to innovate. So when you think about personalized healthcare, and frankly, that's the way it should be. We don't we don't go to a hotel um, and expect to be treated, you know, the same way as everyone else. We don't, you know, we have our, our reward programs with our airlines and, and our hotels and all these things that are very personalized. And frankly, when I order food online, I, I go to my app and it tells me what I've been ordering for the last month and asks me if I'd like to do it again. And then they ask me if they'd like to have it delivered. That's not how healthcare has been. And so what we've been doing is moving to that that place because healthcare should be personalized. It's a very personal, uh, it's a very personal uh, piece, and the business of it is is incredibly complicated because not only do you have all the technological needs, um, and the financial considerations, but in some cases in the Medicare space, you have the regulatory hurdles to overcome. Um, and so, you look at the story that we just listened to, and there's an awful lot in it behind the scenes to make that happen. You have to, you have your infrastructure and your technology and the interoperability between systems and you, and you have to be able to um, allow access to the consumer, the patient or the member in an easy fashion. And so all of that um, takes time and effort. And, and frankly, what we've seen in the last six months has, um, has really been kind of amazing as the, as the industry step forward and started treating patients and members like consumers. When you think about that individual story Stephanie shared and then Tom's feedback on, you know, the business side and really the infrastructure that supports it, you know, sticking on that personalized note, Partners in Care does a lot with social determinants of health. Um, and when we talk about personalized health care, I don't think you can talk about that without talking SDOH. Can you tell us a little bit about what Partners in Care is doing, not just in the last six months, but overall, uh, to help direct good personalized care and maybe how that dovetails with social determinants of health? I'm delighted you included uh, a community-based organization on the panel today. A lot of what we have been doing for a long time is looking at how to fully integrate medical care and social care. So we are quite convinced, as the research has shown for many years, uh, that health happens at home and that uh, we spend a small amount of time under the direct care and interface with healthcare systems and providers, uh, but then we go out and how we live 
and how we understand and utilize the advice and resources we may have or may not have been given is highly determinative of the outcome uh, of the investment of health resources. So we have been very interested from the business model perspective in uh, what we uh, call in a loving way, moving the cheese, uh, looking at what happens up front, uh, where are there sustainable and appropriate um, interventions and therefore investments that can be made that will really modify health outcomes across a population in a sustainable way because obviously the health system and payers have to uh, be strong for all of us. Uh, but uh, as we recognize social determinants, food, transportation, understanding, getting meds, knowing how to take them, communicating with your health providers, exercise, all the things we heard about. Uh, a lot of those require um, resources from the community. There's a full array of experts who are subspecialists in food or exercise or all those things. And which ones are vetted? How do you credential them? How do you deploy them? How do you know that they responded? Uh, and how do you know that uh, what the results are and learn and together where are the best ways to redistribute our investments in health outcomes. So as a CBO, we're trying to build those regional delivery systems like we built with doctors, used to be um, cottage industry, individual practices, they became systems of care across regions. So we have been building networks of home and community-based services. So a health provider, so a, a health plan like these excellent ones could get one partner who could help coordinate that whole array, dizzying array of complex solutions in the community. So uh, we're, we work at that systems level and then the case management level of identifying with the plan, what is it this person needs and what are the, uh, the appropriate um, interventions and how long should they last, how big, what's the dose, what's the duration, what's the frequency, and, and how will they be paid for? They're not all available through the Older Americans Act endlessly. So, so an adventure in redesign. I, you know, I like what you're talking about and what you guys are doing at Partners in Care Foundation because <laughs> I think that's exemplifying those intersections of community and resources to align them with payers and others, you hit on a couple of things. You talked about coordination and what the individual needs. Um, and if I think about the journey we had with our son who was a perfectly healthy toddler, an event dependent quadriplegic because of a rare disease 24 hours later, the first six months of being in the hospital, my interpretation of care coordination was someone handing me another packet. And as a mom who was hundreds of miles away from home, it became kind of infuriating because that wasn't what I needed. It wasn't what our family needed. Every person's story is unique. Um, Tom, let's move over to you. You know, you sit atop really a trifecta of organizations in the jo joint venture you're heading up. Um, and there's multiple foci there. How, and, and initiatives, I'm sure, how are these three organizations viewing personalized healthcare or patient experience? It's a great question. So for, for the viewers slash listeners, the joint venture um, has two parents. One of them is CVS Health, so that's CVS and Aetna. And the other parent is a local health system, which is um, Alina Health. And so when, when those organizations got together, the vision slash mission was to do exactly this, is to improve health healthcare, not just in the traditional sense of outcomes, but the experience to align incentives, to make it easy to understand and for, to, to cut through some of the, the barriers and the red tape. And so when, when I, took the role a couple of years ago, it was fascinating to sit in the room with the, the CEO of Aetna and the CEO of Alina and myself, and we're talking about all the things we can do. And what, what was painfully obvious is that we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to do the right thing for the patient and or the member. The problem is we're not talking about the individual. We're talking about a patient or a member. And so through the joint venture, we're combining those viewpoints 
and saying, look, this is a whole person. It's not just through the lens of what the health plan thinks the individual needs or what the, what the uh, provider thinks. And so, you know, taking the best of both worlds, the, the, um, the clinical aspects that are, that Alina has to offer and incorporating that into how we care for the patient. So in a traditional health plan, and I've been doing this for 20 plus years, in a health services department that's staffed by nurses and clinical personnel, and they're doing their very best and they care. And the problem is they're nurses sitting in a call center. And so we take the clinical staff that's right here in our backyard that works for the hospital system and use that infrastructure as our, as our healthcare services infrastructure. And then we use the Aetna and the CVS infrastructure to do what they're good at. That's the technology and the innovation. And then you combine those with the ideas from the people on the front line with the technology, the, the, the financial capability of, of CVS Health. And I get to put all that together and drive what we hope is real innovation in terms of patient satisfaction and outcomes in, uh, in Minnesota. It's nice to know that there is just this fundamental shared synergy across those organizations. June, when you think about what Tom's talking about on the business aspect of sides, side of things, excuse me, and the business levers that exist, you know, how do we ultimately ensure the needs of a patient can be met regardless of financial means or even propensity to pay? That's a tall, that's a tall order. Um, I guess all of us would like all of our needs met. Uh, we, we want to um, also protect healthcare systems from being responsible for everything. Uh, they already responsible for a lot. Um, and we don't want to uh, necessarily buy everything. So I think, uh, you know, from the community perspective, uh, we, and I'm sure healthcare as well, we, we believe in love and care uh, for others and meaningful service. We see one of the social determinants that helps with mental health. Uh, depression apparently is extremely um, alleviated by doing nice things for other people, being uh, meaningful and purposeful in your living. And so uh, one of what we think the navigator from the community side that provides care coordination for social care and partnership with health systems um, is to really help coordinate not just purchased services or arranged or referred services, um, but people, the neighbors, the, the relatives, the friends, because sometimes what happens if someone gets in a crisis, their needs are intensive, it lands on one person, that person goes a while and they wear out uh, and, and they give up. And so if you can distribute and coordinate and have those people support each other, the person has more social contacts, more support, this is um, a really important part of meeting needs in um, what we call a natural support systems that, that need investments, uh, especially leadership and facilitation for connection. Some of the IT systems do that as well. So I think that is very, very important. You know, I would imagine, you know, it's hard sometimes to quantify the things that don't happen, that that kind of grassroots support it really does help lower not just that physical, mental, and emotional burden of those caregivers and the patient themselves, perhaps, but that it can help lower the cost or the financial access needed for those additional or potentially costly services. Presumably, if you get people um, uh, in a sufficiently stable condition and happy enough uh, or stable and comfortable enough, their health needs uh, are are diminished, and uh, they don't necessarily have to turn to the health system for, you know, you see some people who are alone, isolated, and lonely go to the physician frequently, um, partly because it's a relationship. And so if you can help mobilize their faith-based organizations, their, uh, their school alumni systems, their, their neighborhood and volunteer supports. Now, this has been a problem under COVID because a lot of people that we're bringing things like 
seniors who are del delivering meals on wheels, which is more than food, you know. It's, it's someone who knows you and sees if you're getting in trouble. Um, a lot of them had to stay home. And uh, so now we're learning how, how else can we do some of these things and the use of virtual. So of course that uh, the thing, I don't know whose job it is to solve is the uh, digital divide. We didn't used to worry quite as much about it, but right now everybody ought to have the utility. Uh, running water, electricity, internet and the device, the visual capability. This I think is getting very fundamental in our, our modern world. Yeah, I think we are very quick to forget in this day and age that not everyone is running around with an iPhone. That's a really good point. Um, Stephanie, we'll come back to you. I'll hit you with two questions now, because I know you, I was really interested in what Humana is doing on the other side of things, which is how do you find those individualized needs and then weigh in also on what the others did about balancing the business side of that journey to really get focused in on personalized health and how we do that. Yeah. So, I mean, a, a few things, starting with the last question, you know, I, I think that we have, we're at the point that we accept that health has many dimensions. And if we're going to improve health outcomes, we really have to deal with whole health needs. Um, you know, fortunately, we're really at Humana, we're really talking about how your social um, your social needs and your home, your home and community environment are upstream uh, influencers of your health, as are your mental health and your behavioral health needs. So um, they they really are um, increasingly, you know, equal components of of how we're addressing um, our members' needs. Um, and, and to that end, my team, uh, the Office of Population, Population Health, as you mentioned earlier, is we're really focused on, on social determinants of health and how do we better identify and address those social needs of our, of our members. And you know, one big barrier there is just knowing what needs that they do have. Um, that's not something that we usually get through medical claims. So, um, we have to do uh, a few things. We've done quite a bit of, 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 of just surveying our members. Um, we've integrated social needs screenings into our care management programs. Uh, we're working really closely with, uh, with healthcare providers to help them better integrate uh, these social health dimensions into the way that they practice and the way that they support their patients. Um, and that, you know, June put it beautifully earlier around, you know, uh, or um, has put it beautifully before about, you know, how all the, all the different pieces that there are to connect to, to, meet, to address some of these needs. And um, one thing that we're doing with Revel Health is um, uh, completing some comprehensive social needs screenings uh, across our population. Um, using multiple channels to help pe meet people where they are, to um, in, uh, allow them to communicate with us uh, what, what their needs are so we can, you know, uh, both on our end have some better analytics and, and identify better members who need some extra support in this realm, um, but also help us inform some of the interventions and partners we need to, to, to implement. For instance, you know, a food intervention, it looks a little bit different uh, if you have access for, to transportation versus if you don't have access to transportation. So having a really uh, comprehensive view of member needs is, is helping us, um, you know, get a little bit closer to that personalization. Um, when you hear Stephanie's answer about the surveys and assessing the needs, I'm sure organizations do something similar. How do we balance needs and maybe the assumptions that comes from those needs against, say, patient goals. Because while there may be a perceived need or a documented need, it doesn't necessarily align with maybe what a patient wants if we're talking about personalized health care. How do organizations begin to tackle that or what do you think is important we keep in mind when we talk about needs versus goals for any one patient? So I love that question. It's, it's a complicated answer. Um, I think... Generally, surveys are an important part of, of what we do. They'll, they'll, give, they'll paint a broad, 
picture of, of what we're looking at. They don't answer the, the, the question of what the individual wants or needs. And, you know, it's, it, it's complicated because um, depending on the program that individuals in, they, they have different resources available to them. And so we're talking about healthcare, but a commercial individual covered by group coverage or individual um, covered under Medicare versus one covered under Medicaid, they have different resources available to them and frankly, different needs. And so um, the healthcare system has to be able to understand where the patient is and what resources are available, one, and then two, be able to meet them where they are. If it's a, if it's a Medicaid patient, they may not even have a roof over their head. So going out and, and help meeting them, uh, try and find that roof for them. If it's a Medicare patient, it's social isolation can be a big, big problem. I think it was discussed earlier. It's, you know, helping that individual connect with the community-based resources. Um, on the commercial side, we tend to forget um, uh, that the needs there are just as great. They're just different. Behavioral health problems are a massive um, opportunity for us to improve just general health across across the population. So, it it you know whether it's concierge services for for the Medicare population, whether it's um, service coordinator type individuals in the Medicaid population, or going out and, and doing lunch and learns for your commercial clients and helping them understand what really is available. It's getting, getting them the, the knowledge and the resources they need to, to help care for themselves, but then also listening, you know, making sure that we're connecting with the physicians who are, who are caring. And if we're getting feedback on on a survey or um, um, through some of this new technology, whether it's telemedicine or telemonitoring, that we're doing something with it. And I, I don't know how often, and a lot of you have probably felt the same thing. You go into a doctor's office over the last five to 10 years and you fill out three to five to 10 pages of questionnaire and no one ever asks you about any of that. There may be some things in there that need to be addressed. And so it's, it's, Taking, taking that, that new phase of consumerism to that next level and actually getting feedback and doing something with it. Yeah, you know, I was actually pouring over some claims data on a client project this morning, trying to find some commonalities, common denominators between some patients aside from a diagnosis code. And, you know, those are the, the aspects of what we're talking about today don't come across on a claim. And also what couldn't have been more apparent is how unique each patient is. June, what do you think we can be doing better? I mean, you see it very much at a community level on aligning a patient's needs with the actual goals. You know, I even think about a diabetic that might want, have, be, have a really vested stake in wanting education and doing better uh, with maybe with their diet or their lifestyle. And you have other patients that are just content to keep doing their insulin, checking their HbA1c. How do you balance needs and goals from your perspective? Well, I think... Targeting is very important because, as again, we can't do everything for everyone all the time. Uh, now we do see these dramatic uh, revolutionary advances in uh, a technological ability to stratify, to uh, risk stratify, to try to identify. Uh, we see it, for instance, with Medicaid um, in California. There's a program now where they look they isolate out lists of Medi-Cal patients, Medicaid patients who have been to the ER three times in six months or they're homeless. And we know that it's a good investment of time if we can connect with those people. Now, is everyone waiting for us to help them? Are they willing to open the door, answer the phone? Uh, so, um, but new systems are coming up. Now we know they're all high need. There's something wrong. It's, it's they're making, uh, expensive choices to get the wrong care, no continuity. Um, and But there's a new um, IT that connects the ER. So you can tell if I went to ER A today and I go to ER B tomorrow, when I arrive, they can see what happened yesterday at the priory. They can also flag that person. So I have a list of people I can't reach. I'm trying to go out. My job is as a community agencies to go out, find, engage these people, try to help them get to a consistent medical home. 
they, they have one that's available and try to make sure they have a roof over their head, they have the food and all those things, get their cooperation. But so I haven't flagged. So if they go to the ER and there's someone I haven't been able to reach, we can run someone right over there and get face to face. We have a much better shot at connecting if we're talking like this than if we're just trying to ring someone up. Texting works better. Uh, showing up works better. So um, I think we have to look for high need. A lot of that means after the fact, these are people that are in trouble. We're just not gonna be able to prevent everything in the world. So we look at where are the people we think need us the most that we can help. So a lot of those things are very important. People leaving the hospital at high risk of readmission. That can be done electronically using LACE criteria. We work with hospitals and physician groups to send social workers, community health workers, uh, to help reduce readmissions with very brief interventions, but they're all targeted. They're, they're selected for specific kinds of risk factors. So I think these kinds of issues are um, big drivers of where we should invest our resources to really make a difference for people and for population, for the, for the whole population's health. Those one-to-one -one connection points are, are so important. You got to so, connect and ask them what did what did they care about and and tie to those goals, as you say. Yeah, you know, I was uh, recently reminded about the advanced care planning process and kind of the five wishes we ask a patient about. And I think anywhere in a care journey, uh, whether it's an acute thing or a chronic condition or something, one of life's many curveballs uh, when we're talking about health. You know, I think at any point in time, you could have a patient make just top three wishes about anything they need. And those, those personal connections go a long ways in so many regards. Stephanie, how do you take that survey a step further to go needs versus goals? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, you know, uh, a, a few things. So trying to get as, as much of this information to the hands of that one-on-one, -on -one, that person that the, our members are talking to so that they can quickly um, see kind of a, a, a fuller picture of the member's needs to help facilitate that conversation. You know, if we, it's hard to reach members. Um, and if we meet, if we do reach them, it's, you know, we have to try to get in as much as we can. And, and um, so there's a lot at, at being asked for those clinicians who are on the phone, but uh, we're working really hard um, behind the scenes to try to better feed that that information. Like, oh, we really think this member might be uh, at risk of being food insecure or um, of being lonely, so that they can try to elevate, elevate those as potential barriers to care um, and hopefully address those. Um, in addition to talking about the broader, you know, managing your chronic conditions or your making sure you're taking your medications um, as prescribed. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And then uh, another piece is we do have some additional flexibilities now from CMS um, to offer new uh, tailored benefits to our Medicare Advantage members. Uh, in a lot of Medicaid plans, the Me Medicaid Managed Care, a lot of states are requiring uh, new and more um, uh, you know, innovative social benefit to be offered and, and having this cl clear view of the prevalence of some of these needs is allowing us to better structure our plan design and benefits so that we, people can have the things that they need when they need it to achieve their best health, whatever that is to them. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what we're talking about today, the, the best thing for each individual. And, you know, you started us out with that story about the patient, Teresa, and her needs, and I think about even her food need. You know, maybe her daughter, you know, a grandchild's able to help her a few days a week, but not on others. These things become very nuanced and very unique. So I think it's great that everyone is working towards this because at the end of the day, and I think, Tom, you said it best in talking about the joint venture when everyone first sat down, that it would, has to be about the patient, about the individual, whether it's a sick journey, a well journey. Um, I want to wrap up and just ask each, each of you one final time, and we're, we're a little short of time, so maybe just a moment or 90 seconds. 
in reflecting on how personalization in healthcare can truly impact individuals, not just the bottom line. So we can have a whole session about that too. What has been either your biggest lesson learned over the years, or what do you think remains the biggest opportunity when we talk about personalized health? Um, I'll start with Tom. So it's not fair to only give me 90 seconds to answer that question. <laughs> Good point. Noted. Noted for everyone. Please continue. Um, I think uh, the biggest lesson learned is that um, we have such a long way to go. And that's what makes me excited about working in healthcare and in this space. It, the, the ability to, to compare technology with, with the, the evolving landscape of healthcare to truly move towards consumerism is what is really exciting and what I think is our biggest opportunity. June, the same question to you. What is your biggest lesson learned or what do you think remains our biggest opportunity? I love that this very old research about social determinants of health, really driving health outcomes, has become recognized. Uh, and the opportunity is, uh, can we design fully integrated partnership between health systems and community resources that we're going to need to address those um, so we don't want to it's build versus buy. So we want to co-design uh, the new system of care that fully integrates medical and social care. And it's hard for health system to recognize community systems, which are smaller, less sophisticated and resource, but they're specialists. They have distinctive knowledge and skill and position in the community. So I'm, I'm hopeful that these partnerships are really beginning to unfold and that we can um, influence that to the to the betterment of people's lives. Stephanie, what do you think? What's their biggest lesson? Your biggest lesson learned, or our biggest opportunity that remains? Uh, I can be pretty quick because I agree wholeheartedly. Again, uh, as I said before, with with the other panelists, that you know, so much has changed in the last couple years in this space. There's so much more. There's so many more use cases of successful integration of, 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 of social services into healthcare. There's so much more research that's more firmly connecting, um, the, connect, uh, addressing social needs with an improved health outcome that um, it's just very exciting to see it. And um, it's going to take a lot for us to act quickly as a big system um, to integrate these lessons so that we can to do this successfully um, because it is, uh, a, frankly, you know, a, a change in perspective for a large organization to think of truly personalized individual needs. But um, it's uh, it's exciting that a lot of this, the so much momentum is going towards this space. You know, I think Tom's sentiment about a long way to go. June talking about the power of partnership to these robust community resources, which are integral to small doctor's offices and large mega systems alike. And Stephanie, your eloquent points about the learning and research and how we can integrate this and even the, the fundamental survey work at Humana and how you carry that forward for patients like Teresa are, are also well recognized. And I think there are so many powerful stories out there that we're learning, not just those research cases of where personalized healthcare is truly making a difference. So I want to invite everyone, if you're not already, there is a Q&A panel. If you have any questions for any of our esteemed guests um, about personalized healthcare, their organizations, their background, um, or projects they're working on, we have a few minutes. Please go ahead and use the Q&A and put those in there, and we'll be sure to make sure we ask our panelists before we wrap up today. I want to thank you all one last time, uh, and we'll uh, see who's moderating here momentarily. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, June. And thank you, Stephanie, for your expertise today. Thank you. So we had some questions come in, and I'd love to pose those to the group. And uh, first question was, I think, directed towards Tom. So the question was about EMRs. And just the idea that electronic medical records aren't really built for members. They're built for clinical systems. So how do you bring that personalized approach to member experience when you're handcuffed to a system that doesn't really do this? So that's, that's been something we've been working on for the last couple of years um, with my organization. You're right, EMRs are not built for the individual. They're, frankly, 
for all the physicians um, who are listening. They probably know they're not built for the physicians either. Um, there, it's more of a financial infrastructure and it helps with the billing and the management of the patient. So you take what you can from the EMR and you build that interoperability. And so you, you connect it to a, a, a interface that will actually work with the, the individual and with the patient. And that's easier said than done. There are a lot of different EMRs and different versions of the EMR. But if we can start simple, you know, which is what we're doing with, with my provider partner in Minneapolis in integrating the EMR, you can actually do a better job with patient care too. You have real-time access to the information as a health plan. You're not waiting for a claim to be submitted and then analyzed through a system and then sent to a nurse to say, hey, we recognize that your labs came in six weeks ago. We're getting it real time. And if we can get to that point, and I think we can at some point as an industry, we'll be able to answer that very question that was posed. Great, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that's posed, I think I'm really curious on hearing from each of your perspective, the idea of SDOH, Social Determinants of Health, when did that come into the lexicon for each of your organizations? Well, we've been at this for um, 15 years, 20 years. Um, because we come from the social side. Uh, and the research was mature when we began looking at it. The, uh, the, the evolution of evidence-based programs to help consumers improve their health outcomes because we saw that behavioral factors, we all know quitting smoking. Now we're learning about exercise. Now we're learning about nutrition, managing stress, all these things. Are, there are tools that are emerging that are that are brief, that are powerful, that can help people with those. And then, of course, housing and transportation, poverty, uh, racism, you know, what Black Lives Matter taught us all about uh, racism, ageism, and all the issues that, that impact. But there are some we can get our hands around <laughs> with an individual on a personalized basis, even your little, little boy with that dramatic... Uh, youth uh, health crisis that was, was so serious. And there were things people could do, as you said, that would have really helped you along the path to navigate the system and to be able to achieve the best stability and, and calm family structure possible with these threats. So uh, these are old, deeply researched and new research coming every day, but um, it's not news. We've been waiting and working to bring them. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> yeah, from the, from the Humana perspective, I, you know, as a Medicare Advantage uh, plan, things like post-acute meals and non-emergent medical transportation have really long been part of um, our plan design, uh, as, as is obviously like complex case management. But it was really in the last five years or so that we started putting it more together as a, as a looking at more dimensions of, of um, social determinants of health. Um, when Humana declared our bold goal in 2015 of improving the health of the communities we serve by 20%, um, you know, it really forced us to look at what are those community level factors that are influencing the health of our members and, and the, their health related quality of life. And it, when we looked, at you know their conditions, their age, there are you know all these different facets of health, and um, we really honed in on um, these social needs as driving a high number of unhealthy days for our, our, our specifically our Medicare Advantage uh, members. So things like food insecurity and loneliness were really more correlated with um, poor quality of life than some of the other more clinical measures that we are looking at, and that's really driven a lot of Humana strategy of, of um, better addressing these through plan design, through our programs and, and uh, benefits. So for me, it's, a, it's an interesting question because um, I've managed different programs, um, Medicare, Medicaid, or, or commercial in upwards of six different states over my career. And so it's really a function of the product we're talking about is when it came into the discussion. Um, 
you know, when I was running Medicaid plans to June's point, that's just part of, that's just part of it. Whether the acronym was used or not, a right. community-based organization is a critical uh, partner to the, uh, to the health plans serving the Medicaid population. And that's, that's, those are some of the biggest barriers you have to overcome. And you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum on the commercial side, yeah, to Stephanie's point, it probably has been within the last five years where that's really where programs have been started, have started to develop and bubble up, um, addressing behavioral health and some of the social, social aspects of the commercial population that up until recently have, have been unaddressed. Great. One of the other questions is around credentialing. So June, you'd mentioned uh, credentialing of resources. How can organizations do this at scale? I'm guessing that's also part of what both Tom and Stephanie are doing uh, locally and nationally as well. Yeah, well, there's a, quite a movement. We were fortunate to be at the front of the movement with funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation, the Archstone Foundation, working with the Administration on Community Living, National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, build out this prototype of a regional delivery system. So now there are um, lead community-based organizations that form a network of, of other community-based organizations that provide services. So let's say Humana wants something for the state of California. So we created, you know, it's an, another health plan. We created a, a statewide network. So that plan can have a member anywhere in the state, it's going to want equivalent access to these kinds of services if it's ever going to offer them as a benefit. It has its own rules. So we have created that for evidence-based health self-management programs that we can campaign for that plan and for in-home care coordination. At the moment it's virtual, but typically we go and sit at the kitchen table, we root around, we look and see what people are up against. Uh, so all but 11 states now have significant regional home and community-based delivery system networks, most of them statewide. California's kind of a big state to be statewide, but that, so there, there's a new resource in town. It's getting, um, and, and it credentials. Um, we had to make a lot of changes to fit what all the regs and rules and requirements and risks that health payers and providers carry. We had to get uh, NCQA accredited. Uh, we had to raise our insurance. We had to get cyber insurance, change our IT, address PHI very differently, and develop criteria for which agencies in the community can be trusted to respond, to respond timely, to follow consistent interventions that fit protocols so everyone knows what they're buying, and to participate in documenting and, and collaborating properly. So it's, it's been a kind of a big build a hold in infrastructure to parallel healthcare, uh, but there, it's really out there. So if you want it, you can go to the Institute for um, uh, the and National Association of Area Agencies on Aging has an Institute for um, uh, Aging and Disability Business Institute. You can contact me, I'll connect you because we love introducing uh, people to their local regional. We just service California, but we try to be thought leaders in America. So we like uh, brokering, uh, just introducing, um, matchmaking for, for local partnerships with some of these delivery systems. Because we feel if, if healthcare builds it all and makes all the solutions themselves, they'll starve the community and then they're gonna wonder who's gonna provide the meals who's going to provide the love, who's going to be the neighborly volunteer support system. So, but credentialing, very important. Great. And some Definitely of those IT about. systems that, that you were referring earlier, um, they don't, they, re, they refer to networks. In fact, we're thinking about a blog, what's really a community network? There, there are very sophisticated resource directories that have connectivity for health and the community resources, which are very important, a very important advance, step forward. But a, a network like um, a medical network actually has got a legal structure, contracts, standards, credentialing, uh, and set protocols and interventions that we think are very important. So we, we love 
to think about networks uh, in a very different way. Great, Stephanie and Tom, anything to add to that? Um, I don't really have anything to add because uh, June put it perfectly. I, I, it is not an easy feat to work with um, to work with a, a healthcare organization. There are a lot of hurdles, and it's definitely something that um, we, um, my team, we think a lot about as we try to form new partnerships. Just the burden we're putting on organizations that we want to bring into our network, so to speak, but we also, as a health care organization, are heavily regulated ourselves, and it's hard not to impose some, so many of those burdens on um, the social service organizations and the community-based organizations. Um, so I think that's a, definitely an area of opportunity that we're, gonna, that we're gonna have to overcome if we're really gonna get more integrated. I'll just, I'll just throw my voice in as a, a strong, agree with that with Stephanie on that the uh, the regulatory hurdles um, that we have to overcome there are significant and there's there is an opportunity for our industry to do a much much better job in this space well I think it is a great opportunity and for the community as well because uh, of course healthcare brings a lot to the partnership so I did not mean to sound um, complaining about it, just to say that it takes significant investment on both sides to bridge the chasm between two worlds that are both really crucial to successful population health management. Um, so I'm a big fan of health care. You know, I worked in hospitals. I ran a visiting nurse association, even though I'm a social worker. But uh, I think the marriage, I think a lot of work has been done to solve some of the problems that the deep pockets and, and high regulation status that the health system bears um, can be addressed safely and still meet some of these needs in a cost-effective and, and natural neighborhood-based way. Right, so we've got about four minutes left before we move to the innovation session. So that's one last question here. Um, CMS has set up chronic care management to try to provide regular care for patients with chronic conditions between physician visits. Why are so few people getting this type of care? And what do you see as the barriers for that? Well, it's one more thing, you know, there's so much change afoot and it was too small in the past. Uh, but I think under COVID with the revolution in telehealth, uh, this has broken through and freed up the ability for people to connect with their health resource efficiently, effectively. You don't have to drive, you know, you don't have to go through the waiting room, it's better for everybody. Um, then this additional navigation without having to, it, it's a telehealth thing as well. So we're just testing it with the community side. How can we partner with health systems to provide this kind of guidance that helps with patients understanding and implementation of lifestyle changes or medication use or communicating with the uh, the physician, the nurse practitioner to, to really be a, an effective partner to the health system. A strong consumer brings a great deal to that. This is one more bridge and it's typically um, what we like to call in the alternative workforce. That it could be, it's not quite yet justified as a community health worker, uh, can be a social worker, but um, we think it should get to that, but an LVN, a CNA, you know, people with um, a uh, less expensive licensure structure can play a very powerful role in helping integrate. And this brings um, proactive, instead of waiting for the person to call, guidance where needed for periods of time. So I think it's actually promising and it's unfolding, but you know, it's hazard is there's a million changes people need to make, which ones are they gonna make? All right, well with that, thank you very much to Robin for moderating today's panel and thank you to the panelists for your time and for uh, the insights that you just shared with everybody. It sounds like there may be some opportunity to connect people with some of the resources that June had mentioned too, so we'll, we'll uh, post information around that. Today's Innovation Lab is gonna be presented by Rebels Health, Rebels Health's SVP of Technology and Development, Louise Bergulio. So she'll be talking a little about behavioral research and how that influences the ways to bring that personalization we just talked about um, to your members and how you can how we use that to build some of our products. So Louise, take it away. 
Uh, so like Ryan mentioned, wanted to share with all of you some insights that we're gleaning from our behavioral research that we do. So some of you may have this capability within your organization, it goes by many names. Um, some of you may refer to it as ethnographic research or field research. Um, but at Revel, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to take some sort of health action. It could be anything from going to visit their doctor, um, to getting a mammogram, to filling out a health assessment. And when you're trying to get people to take an action, you really have to understand a lot about what makes them tick. So when we're doing behavioral research, it's really less about quantity um, and getting sort of a broad or superficial view, right? So it's not, you know, we're not going out and talking to hundreds of people um, or doing, you know, wide ranging surveys. Um, what we're doing is we're spending like the entire day with sometimes about a dozen people. Um, and when people say, you know, it's really important to meet your population, meet your members where they're at, we take that really literally. Um, so we're often in people's homes. We've had people when they're talking about health and how they make healthcare decisions, it really centers around food. So you next, next thing you know, we're in their kitchen and we're going through their pantry and they're showing us through their refrigerator. Um, and this is really the way that we actually learn how members think about health, um, how they behave and uh, what, what barriers really exist in their way between them and sort of making these healthy actions. So today I wanted to share some of that research that we've done. I wanted to make it really topical. Um, you know, I think, I think I think right now when we're talking about how to engage people and how to talk people, the thing we have all around us and hang over our heads is the fact that we're in a pandemic. So I wanna share a little bit of what we've done and what we've learned about communicating with people in a pandemic. Um, and hopefully also this will be a little bit practical and give you some ideas about what you could potentially do within your organization. Um, so first, let's talk about really quickly too, how does this behavioral research get applied? Um, so at Revel, it's informing things like how we're reaching out to a member, the channels we're using, but one of the most important things uh, is actually that it's informing the messaging, the tone of voice and the things that we're saying. Uh, and you know, getting somebody to act is again, what really makes them kind of tick in here and tick in here, and that's how you get action. Uh, so I wanted to actually give you an example. So often at Revel, what we're doing is we're actually playing with many messages, um, many different sort of flavors, and we're actually assigning those to different people based on what we know about them. So again, this is through the technology engine and through our data science platform. There are many different sort of behavioral themes at play and they're assigned. But sometimes we actually do find that, that one is doing a bit better than the others. Um, and for those of you who maybe don't have the technology that Revel's bringing into bear, just knowing in general what's often a successful message can be um, really, really helpful. So let's talk about a time where we actually had a, a winning message. Um, so this was in the context of uh, Revel does a lot of health assessments. Um, so we're trying to get members to share information about their health. Often this happens when we're representing a payer, um, so a health plan who's trying to collect that information. It can range, but it's often pretty clinical in nature. Um, so let's imagine we're reaching out uh, and we're trying to motivate that member to fill out this health assessment. So we wrote it one way, where we're asking the member to take this health assessment and we use what we were calling consumer voice. Consumer voice is characterized by the fact that it's friendly, it's empowering, uh, it speaks almost as if it's, it's a peer. So a message a consumer voice might give is share your voice so we understand how to serve you best. You know, that might be the way we lead uh, with this outreach where we're trying to get a member to, to fill out their health assessment. Um, and this was informed by looking at lots of consumer communications, so very friendly things, um, you know, things that you might see more from the retail sector than the healthcare sector. Another one that we used was provider voice. Um, and this was, believe it or not, uh, determined from like reverse engineering a bunch of actual communications from doctors. How do doctors actually talk? If they're sending an email, what are they saying in the email? Um, and what we noticed about provider voice, it's pretty transactional, it's pretty direct, it's respectful, but it has a different tone. And so you can see that uh, it might say something like, it's time, it's time to complete your health assessment so that we can evaluate your care. And now I'll tell you what our hunch was about which of these was going to do better. But first, I'm going to let you all take a stab at it. So I'm about to launch a poll. And based on what I just shared, cast your votes. Do you think consumer voice got more people to take the health assessment or provider voice? See the votes coming in. If you're thinking about it, Now's the time to place your bets. 
give it another five seconds. Still see some trickling in. All right, so let's see what you said. So you, most of you, most of you said consumer voice. Um, and I would say general intuition, you know, a lot of what we know about engaging consumers in a friendly way um, would probably point to consumer voice. It turned out the provider voice was the one that in general, overall, got more people to fill out their health assessments, sometimes to the tune of 10 to 20 percent uh, more people actually taking their health assessment when we use that tone of voice. Uh, and that was actually our hypothesis going in. So we actually uh, were intentionally playing with this provider voice. And the reason we were doing that is because it was informed by that behavioral research that we had done that I talked about going in. So we had been spending time in people's homes. We had been talking to them about how they shared their health information, how they like to share clinical information. And from those conversations and spending time with people, one trend became abundantly clear. And it was this that consumers want to share healthcare information with their doctors. Um, so uh, people were not used to the idea of sharing healthcare information or having healthcare conversations with their payers, um, with community service organizations. Um, you know, in the, in the um, minds of the general population, healthcare is a conversation between them and their doctors. Um, and again, this is something we learned through these kind of deeper probing conversations that we're having through our field research. So part of why I wanted to share this anecdote with you too is because I think it actually has quite a bit um, we are learning to teach us about how to message and how to engage people in a pandemic. So if you just hold this sort of fundamental truth in your mind, uh, which is that people want to share information with their providers, what do we know about how people want to interact with their providers? Uh, and what can, what can we learn from that in all of our communications? So here's another really interesting trend that we see when we're talking to people about how they engage around their health with providers. So you'll also see other really interesting splits, splits in the population. So one really strong trend is that people who have a chronic condition are looking for a very different relationship with their provider than people who have an acute condition. So somebody with a chronic condition, like Bernadette here, uh, will often look for partnership in their provider. So Bernadette told us a story when we were talking to her. Um, we were talking about, you know, the last time she was, uh, you know, looking for a new provider and what was important in that relationship to her. She was kind of walking us through um, her life. Uh, and she said that before she went to the doctor, she actually asked for the forms ahead of time. So, right, that sort of patient intake form where she gives her history. She actually filled them out ahead of time. So she was very thoughtful about it, mailed them back in uh, to give the doctor also plenty of time to hopefully read it ahead of time. And so for a lot of it's like, this is amazing, the lengths this person will go to to fill out this form. But when you talk to her, what really mattered was she needed him to get up to speed to where she was at because she really wanted to have a conversation that was a partnership and was a meeting of equals. And often when you're talking to people with a chronic condition, you'll hear a lot about that. You know, at the end of the day, I like my doctor because she respects that I'm the one living with this condition and we make decisions together. So that theme of, again, when you, when you kind of become an expert in yourself and your own condition, you start to really look for a partnership kind of a relationship. Now let's contrast that a little bit with what I was talking about as somebody who has an acute condition. Uh, so when we're talking to people with acute conditions out in the field, um, you see totally different. They're looking for expertise and authority and their providers and how their providers interact with them and the tone that they take. So you can imagine something unexpected, something startling has happened to you. In the case of Emily here, what happened was she tore her ACL and she needed knee surgery. And her story is completely consistent uh, with why she liked her provider, why she chose that, the, the, the surgeon actually, uh, and, and felt good about it was because he totally just took charge. He knew what he was doing. He was authoritative. He said he'd done it a hundred times. He wasn't asking her for her opinion. Um, and so you'll see this is completely the opposite of what we talked about uh, when talking with somebody who had a chronic condition. All right, so I promised you that this would get um, somewhat practical uh, given the, the era that we're in of um, trying to do all this outreach, trying to do all this engagement in a pandemic. So let's talk about what we've seen throughout the course of the pandemic. So when this started, you know, Revel reached on sort of our our, our core strength and our training. And we said, we got to start talking to people. We got to get out in the field. Of course, at this point, it was really more digital. So we've been doing a lot more phone calls and video um, and said, we have to understand how this is changing communication. You know, what, what's changing, if anything. 
Um, so here's some things that we've learned and actually some things that third parties have supported as well. Um, so that fundamental concept of trust, you know, when I started this off by saying people trust their providers and they tend to not necessarily trust other actors in the system, uh, it's kind of shifting during the pandemic. And at the very beginning of the pan pandemic, when we did our research, we heard a lot about that. And what we really heard was people looking for institutions, for sources of authority. So, right, if, this, if I'm using some of the language same language I'm using when I was describing what people look for in like a surgeon when they have an acute event, very similar, right? So people, if you look at, and this is a study actually done by McKinsey, a poll that they did, when they say, who do they trust the most? It's these institutions, the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, their doctors, health insurers. Now this wasn't necessarily where they were going to consume information, because frankly, these organizations weren't necessarily getting information out as fast or as aggressively um, as uh, other organizations, but it was by far and away the most trusted. And I will say that it's really unusual, especially how highly trusted health insurers are. Um, that, that does not actually match uh, historically with what Revel has seen. So that was really interesting. Um, and what, what it aligns with, and the reason we started by talking about some of that provider research, is that what we have seen in terms of how people are um, seeking advice and seeking um, information in a pandemic is somewhat mirroring that progression of someone who's dealing with an acute situation. And it's starting to shift a little bit, actually, where what people are looking uh, looking for feels a little bit more like what people are looking for when they have a chronic condition. So at the beginning, we were, again, people were really turning to those institutions for credibility, for authority, to be told what to do. How do I keep my safe? Is there a magic button I can push um, that will make this all just go away? So the, the uh, feeling was very much, how do I end this? What do I need to do? How do I stay safe? Somebody tell me. And now as we're you know talking to people, still hearing some of that, but I think we're entering a new phase where most people are starting to realize that this pandemic is gonna be around for a little while. And people are starting to seek more uh, partnering type information. So this comes in the form of um, people are having to now make decisions about how they live their lives and what kind of risk are they comfortable with and what kind of risk are they not comfortable with. And they're still looking for engagement. They're still looking for help they're still looking for more information, uh, but are seeking more of a partnership mentality uh, where they now get to be agents um, in, in really thinking about how this should work and how this should go forward. Um, so I wanna leave you with a couple of parting thoughts. Um, one is I hope that you feel like um, this is something that you could perhaps apply, this idea of field research in your organization. Um, it's really important. It's the thing that gives us some of our most interesting hypotheses and ideas that we can go test and validate through our data science arm. Um, and then secondly, is just be thinking about in ways, uh, ways in your organization that you can um, really be in tune to where members are in this pandemic. Um, it's a really unique and unusual situation we're in where it's almost like, right, it's a shared experience. Um, and often, um, you know, there, there really is a need to really change your messaging um, to meet different people where they're at. This is actually one of those cases where we're all kind of experiencing this together. Um, so I think the more you can kind of stay in touch with your population, understand where there are meaningful differences, um, and then also understand sort of, you know, where, where we are or all as a whole, um, you can get some, some pretty good actionable insights. And if you need a little bit of help, um, we're going to make this available to you. Um, so this is Revel's uh, Fieldwork Passport. It gives you some good practical tips on how you can uh, do some of this field work that we're describing for yourself. Uh, so you can pull it into your company, you can pull it into your communications um, and uh, more effectively reach and influence uh, your members, patients um, and uh, your population. So thanks. Well, thank you, Louise, and thank you to all the panelists from earlier and uh, Robin Roberts for moderating for us earlier today uh, during the panel. The resource that Louise just showed there, we put it in the, in the chat session, but we'll also get that back out to people. Again, just as a reminder, as you're exiting today, you'll be asked to complete a survey. Uh, please complete that. And if you put your contact information in there, uh, we're going to be choosing somebody to receive $100 charitable donation to the charity of their choice. Also, next week, don't forget one 
1 p.m. Central Time until 2.15 Central next week. We'll see you for our second panel, which is called the One-Two Punch of Innovation and Member Experience for Health Action. So thank you, everybody, again, for joining us.